So in this webinar, uh, we are going to discuss some of the common traps that are set by the GMAT in the quant questions. Now, I, um, in my opinion, these common traps can be uh, broadly divided into two parts. For what I mean by that is traps, uh, what kind of traps are basically set in the GMAT, right? Uh, one I would say are traps which are kind of conceptual based. Uh, what I mean by that is GMAT understands uh, that, uh, that there are a lot of topics where uh, people are not very confident with, and they know that they can take advantage of that to create questions where uh, there's a high probability that students will fall for a trap. Uh, concepts related to percentages, inequality, uh, geometry, uh, number. When I say numbers, what I mean by that is the proper, basic properties of numbers like positive, negative, those kind of things, uh, which if you don't have a very clear cut clarity about, uh, you, there's a there's a high chance that you might make uh, mistakes and you fall for the trap which are set based on these kind of conceptual mistakes. Uh, the other and the more, more important kind of uh, traps, I would say that once your concept is clear, uh, students usually face problem when it comes to applying it. So, so what basically I call process-based traps. Uh, so when you're solving a question, uh, you must have noticed a number of times that you have missed a certain constraint. And I've been talking about this in my webinars a number of times, that read the question properly, uh, make sure that you draw, write down everything. If you don't, uh, you, there's a chance that you may make a mistake uh, if you miss out some uh, some crucial information given in the question, right? Uh, if you, when you're solving DS questions, you have heard of traps like C traps, D traps. Uh, those kind of traps basically fall under the category of lack of analysis. Those traps are set because uh, uh, they know that th these kind of traps, A, B, C, E, these kind of traps that are there in DS questions, they are based on the 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 the, the person who's making these questions for the GMAT, they know that a lot of students just look at a DS question and they feel, yeah, I think the answer may be C or it may be E, and they end up marking the answer. So they expect you to fall for such traps like uh, not uh, not fall doing all the analysis. Lack of visualization is also there. Sometimes you see a geometry diagram, uh, you uh, you make certain assumptions. Um, they give the diagram in such a way that you'll feel, yeah, that this should be an answer. You mark the answer and then you realize, hey, uh, maybe I made a mistake because I assumed something which I shouldn't have. Finally, obviously, calculation mistakes are always there. Uh, I wouldn't fall, I call, call that a trap per se, but there are a lot of uh, questions uh, in word problems where the numbers that are given, are uh, they look very, uh, I would say, scary, uh, like, uh, say, 10.37, 67%, those kind of things. And they expect you to uh, actually solve each and every, uh, do all the multiplication, uh, solve all the qu qu uh, values, find all the values, waste time in it, and maybe in, in the uh, while doing so, end up making a, some kind of a calculation mistake. So, uh, but, but in actual, if I if I look at any GMAT question, uh, and I keep on saying that to my students, if you're doing a lot of calculation, uh, then there's a high chance that you are falling either falling for a trap or you are not doing it in the right way. Okay, so what I'm going to do is basically, uh, as I always do in all you know, my sessions, is that I'm going to take certain questions, okay, where I'm going to show you that if you don't have the right conceptual knowledge, maybe, or if you don't read properly, or you don't do your analysis properly, then you will definitely fall for a trap. Uh, a good part is obviously that you know that this is a session based on traps, so you will be um, kind of uh, alert, but but those of you, uh, but uh, but the idea here is to obviously discuss those traps so that you're uh, that you're alert every time while solving these kind of questions. So the process is going to remain the same, guys. Uh, those of you attending it uh, uh, for the first time, let me uh, tell you what the process is. I'm going to show you a question, um, give you about two minutes to solve the question. Okay. If there's any theory involved uh, in that question, which I feel that you should know about, I will touch upon it so that uh, you get um, you have some conceptual clarity. And uh, whatever be the kind of trap that is set in the question, I'm going to talk about that also a bit. Okay, uh, so if, if this is perfectly clear, uh, um, let me bring up the poll very quickly. Uh, if this is clear, kindly mark yes, uh, so that I can get started and I can give you the first question. Okay, so I can see that it's clear to everyone. So guys, here I'm going to show you the first question. Uh, take it, I'll give you two minutes, solve it, and then after two minutes, I'm going to discuss what's a trap in that question. So here's the first one, guys. And let me bring up the poll.
Okay, another 30 seconds, guys, then I'm going to end the poll. Ten seconds. So I would encourage all of you to mark the answer. I can see there are a few who are still not responding to the poll. It's okay if you get it wrong, uh, but I would suggest that you uh, that you give it a shot. Okay, okay, I have sufficient responses. So let me end the poll now. Okay, so here's the result, uh, and I hope all of you can see it. About 50% of you think that the answer should be D. 43% uh, of you think that the answer is E. I have a few C's also 6%, but uh, thankfully nobody chose option A and option B. So obviously I'm sure you must have understood uh, based on the split that either 50% of you or 43% of you uh, fell for that trap. And I want to talk about that trap first. Now, let's talk about uh, what kind of a trap uh, GMAT sets when it comes to parallel line kind of questions. Now, uh, what you usually do in the exam is whenever you see two lines like this, okay, and you see uh, a line passing through is th uh, like this, a lot of you directly assume that the two given lines, let's say this is L1 and this is L2, let me write them like this, you assume that they are parallel lines. Okay, when you look at this diagram. Now, um, let me reset the poll and let me ask you a question. Is this the correct assumption? You have the diagram like this, you see L1, L2, and you make an assumption that these are parallel lines. Is this assumption correct? Can I assume that they are parallel lines? Okay, now uh, I can see a lot of you are understood what the mistake is. So most of you are now saying, no, we, we cannot assume this, right? So we cannot do that if we are just given the diagram. This is a very, very, very common mistake. Uh, the question, frankly speaking, is not more than a 600 level question, but the mistake that you make in this question makes it slightly difficult. Uh, so first number one learning that you need to keep in mind is that if in the diagram, nothing uh, uh, is indicating that uh, is a parallel line, don't assume that they're parallel line. Okay, you cannot assume that. That's number one learning that I want to give here. Simple question, but uh, a very important learning. What will usually happen is that in the exam, uh, uh, in the question, what will happen is they will either mention somewhere uh, like this, L1 and L2 are parallel lines. Okay, or they will uh, some, do something like this in the below given figure, L1, L2 and M are straight lines. If L1 and they'll put a sign like this. Uh, the, these are two straight bars. Sometimes you may see, uh, though I haven't seen in GMAT, but sometimes you may see it given it like this also, two bars with an arrow or just two straight bars like this. If you see two straight bars like this between two lines in the question, if L1 double bar L2, uh, then what is the value of C minus D, then you should, then you can infer or then you can uh, say that yes, what they are telling me exactly is that uh, line L1 and L2 are parallel. So that information has to be given in the question. If it is not given, you cannot assume, okay? Now, since I cannot assume, I'll go to, to the first statement. I need to find out the value of C minus D, okay? I know that this is 110. So let me look at the first statement. A is 110. Now, important question. Now I'm talking about some conceptual learning. Now, if this is 110, can I say that this is 110? Anyone? Uh, let me bring up the yes and no poll. If A is 110, can I say B is also 110? Keep in mind, I don't know that they are parallel or not. So can I say that uh, angle B is 110? Okay, Shivam says yes in the comment box. A lot of people are saying yes in the... Uh, okay, now I have an almost 60-40 split between yes and no. Okay, now it, it's decreasing a bit. Okay, so I can see some of you are saying, uh, most of you are saying yes, uh, we can infer it. Some of you are saying no. Now this is specifically for people who are saying no. Please keep in mind that this property, uh, when, when uh, between A and B, if I rub this for a moment and mark this as A and B, okay? 
these are known as vertically opposite angles vertically opposite angles and this is valid for any two line it doesn't need to be a parallel line so you take any two intersecting line and the angles that you get opposite each other this one they are always equal so this is if this is a this is also a if this is b this is also b b so this is valid for any general line please keep this in mind okay some people think if they are not parallel we cannot assume that no you can do that so if this is 110 you can say this is 110 but that's it you don't know what is c you don't know what is d you have no way or no way of connecting a b c d because you don't know whether they are parallel or not if they would have been parallel then it would have been a completely different thing but since we don't know they are parallel we will not be able to do anything at all and obviously statement one will then be not sufficient and the same goes for option b also uh, statement two also if i take statement two i know this is 110 all i can say that this is 110 but i won't be able to figure out which one is uh, what is the value of c and d okay uh, so the answer in this case would turn out to be option e so i hope this is clear guys uh, the learning and takeaway from this question a very simple question which i wanted to st uh, start with is make sure that you know the properties of parallel lines and angles so you should know when can you create vertically opposite angles uh, when when do you get uh, straight line angles these these kind of things you should know vertically opposite straight lines you should know what are alternate angles these are things that i would highly suggest that you learn and understand properly uh, and second main learning here is that do not assume that lines are parallel just because they look parallel in the diagram okay either as i told you it will be mentioned the question that they are parallel or you will have something like this given in the exam l1 pair two straight lines l2 only then you should infer that they are parallel lines okay so this was an easy question uh, i hope it was clear to everyone now let's take a slightly uh, slightly difficult in the previous one again if you still have questions in uh, uh, in uh, question number one if there's a doubt or as such uh, please feel free to ask otherwise you can start the second question i have added the poll Another 30 seconds, everyone, then I will end the poll. Ten seconds. So we encourage all of you once again, please put in the responses. It's okay even if you get it wrong, that's totally fine. At least uh, in the exam, you know you need to mark something. This will get to know whether you are good at guessing also or not if you have to. Okay, okay, I'm ending the poll now. So, uh, first of all, uh, let me ask you, how did you find this question? Was it, diff was it difficult, easy, uh, tricky, difficult in the previous one? What's your opinion of this question? Okay, Lipsa says easy. What about the others? Was it easy? Okay, Shweta says difficult. Alina says easy. Vivin says easy. Okay. Uh, so I would categorize this uh, question as Jigesh. I asked whether the question was difficult or easy. Uh, I'm not uh, 
so I hope you put, put your responses in the poll. If you didn't, then, that, then that's okay. Okay, uh, frankly, this question is a 650 level question. Okay, okay, Sanchez says, <laughs> can't say until, until I'm right. Okay, Iman says medium. Uh, this is, I would categorize this as a 650 level question, guys. And there, there are basically two traps set here. Okay, I'm going to talk about two traps which uh, you may have fallen into. Now, as I told you, whenever, and I've been saying this in webinars, whenever you start a question, read it meticulously, jot down information which you may think would be relevant to solve the question. So here, you can see that it's given that M is a three-digit positive, okay, positive odd integer. So M is something like this. M is a three-digit number, say A, B, C. What I'm going to do is, I'm uh, since I noticed that it, they're saying odd integer, I will write down somewhere here and say that, okay, it's an odd integer. So C can be one, three, five, seven, nine. It has to be odd. And uh, another important thing is that A, B, C are single digit numbers, right? They have to be single digit. If they're not single digit, then, then we are, we're going to have a problem because, uh, because uh, and, uh, you cannot have a say a cannot be say 11 not possible right then then if you put b as something c as something it will become a four digit number that's not possible so th this is everything that you should have in your copy in your paper wherever you're solving it properly written if you did not do it if you kept everything mentally there's a high chance that you will end up making a mistake now what is the question asking us they are asking us what is the units digit of m okay so they're asking me what is the value of c so i'll write this down on my piece of paper and then i'll move on to statement one Okay, statement one is the product of the hundreds, tens, and units digit is 192. Okay, so they're telling me A times B times C is 192. Okay, now can anyone tell me how can I break 192? Or uh, because I have on the left hand side A times B times C. So uh, if I have to prime factorize 192, how would I break it down and what will I write 192 as? Anyone? Okay, Shraza says, yeah, we need to do prime factorization. You're absolutely correct. Uh, but what would the prime factorization give me? Okay, Sam says two to the power six. That's absolutely correct. So basically uh, you will have a three. Once you take a three, you get a 64. Right, 64 is two to the power six. So one way is to write it like this. Okay, now understand this, whenever you're solving questions like this, uh, the, these small constraints, they are going to help you a lot figure out your answer. Okay, uh, what I mean by that is understand the fact that A, B and C are single digit numbers. So obviously uh, I, what my endeavor could be to break 192 down into such a way in such a way that I get three single digit numbers. Okay. And then I can try and figure out what could be the probable value of A, B, and C. A good thing is I know C can be one, three, five, seven, or nine. And when I'm breaking it down, I am noticing that I have a three with me. Okay. So what I can do is I can write it like this. A, B, C is say, uh, if I assign C as three, this two to the power six can be broken down. I'll try and break it down in such a way that I get A and B. Now notice it is a DS question. So ideally when you get C, you could have stopped, but what I would want you to also check, is there a possibility that C could be one or not? Okay, obviously five, seven, nine is not possible because it does not have a five, seven, nine. So the only thing you need to check is three is there. I need to distribute two to the power six here, two to 64 here. One way to distribute is eight times eight. Okay, uh, there's no other way to distribute it. If I if I switch something this side or something like that, uh, they would become two digit numbers. So for example, if I switch a two here, I get a 16, not possible, I just told you. Uh, one switch which is possible is if I write it like this, eight, four, six. But if I do this, notice all these digits become even. And I need an odd number. So I can discard this case also and infer, okay, this is the only case possible. And from this only you could have inferred, hey, there's no chance that C could be one here. Because I see if I put C one here, I have to th give three to some, either of these two. The moment I give it to something else, it becomes a two digit number. So this case is automatically discarded. I cannot have a eight, four, six with me because I need an even number. So the only case possible is when C is three. This means that statement one is sufficient. Is this clear, guys? 
if yes please mark uh, uh, let me just bring up the poll very quickly and uh, just one sec 33 21 36 let me just write this down uh, 33 then i have 21 36 21 36 i'm just jotting down the the percentage of poll uh, so what you have discussed so far is this perfectly clear I've understood how we need to analyze it how am i using my constraints to figure out i need single digit numbers and what's the best way to split it down split it okay everybody's saying yes so that's absolutely good so see i have i have so statement one is sufficient uh, so my answer out of a b c d e has to be either a or d now if i let me go to the second statement second statement is tens digit is eight so my number was a b c my tens digit is eight but you know that we are looking for C, right? We're looking for C. So statement two is not giving me any additional information to figure out what C can be. C can be one, three, five, seven, nine. All possibilities are still open. Since everything is open and I don't know what is the unique value of C, I'll cancel this out also and say that the correct answer is option A, which you notice only 33% of you marked as the correct answer. Now tell me, after seeing the solution, those of you made a mistake, that's totally okay once again. But can you see how easy this question was? All you had to do, and I was explaining a lot, so it might seem a bit lengthy. But if you look at the solution, what am I doing? I'm making the right inferences. I'm writing down uh, what the possible values of C are. I use that in my statement one to figure out ABC should be a single digit and what are the possible values. And I have my answer. So if this is perfectly clear, please mark yes. If there's anyone who has any doubt, please ask it in the in the chat box. So I'll try and help. I'll try my best to help you out with it. I can see about 10% of you are still saying no. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask in the chat box. In the meantime, I'll very quickly summarize the learning and takeaway. Number one, don't forget the constraint in these kind of questions. Okay, so in the constraint for them is an odd integer in this case. And also you should be comfortable making cases. Like in this case, we tried to make all the cases, right? And we discarded some of the cases saying, hey, uh, this is not possible because of this constraint. If you forget the constraint, uh, we may end up taking both the cases. If you end up taking both the cases, there's a high chance that we'll end up marking the answer as option E. Some of you may combine and end up saying the answer is option C. Okay. So I hope now you understand if you forget the constraint, if you're not comfortable making cases, uh, you may fall for a C or an E trap. Okay. Okay, Amrish is asking, can it not be? Amrish, understand how can it be? Uh, think about it. From second statement, you only know that ABC is a three digit number and the tens digit is eight, but you're looking for the units digit. You're looking for the value of C. What is the value of C? Can you tell me what's the value of C by just knowing about, by just using statement two? I, for the others, I hope this is perfectly clear that uh, constraints, making sure you make the pertinent inferences so that you get the correct answer. Okay, I don't see any other doubts, any other questions. So let's move on to the next question. So here's the next one. And Ambrish, if you still have doubts, please, please uh, respond. I'll try and help you. So here's the question. Uh, here's the poll. Yes, Ambrish A is the only possible for the hundreds place, but you don't know what is the units place. The previous question was based on units digit, not on hundreds digit. The question is about units, not hundreds.
guys another 30 seconds then i'm going to end the poll Ten seconds. I have sufficient responses, but those of you who still haven't responded, kindly do so. It's okay, as I told you. If you get it wrong, that's totally fine. Okay, I'm ending the poll now. Okay, I have an interesting response here. 39% of you think that the answer should be A. 37% of you think that the answer should be D. Okay. And I have about 13%, I think. Let me look at it. 16%. 16% of you think that the answer should be C, uh, E here. Okay. Tell me, how was this question? Uh, did you find it difficult, easy? I, I see a lot of people not, I have seen a lot of people not being very comfortable with uh, coordinates or in geometry in, uh, in, in particular. So I thought it's, it makes sense to give a question based on coordinates. Okay, Shweta says medium, Shivam says 650, easy. Okay, Shahrukh says easy, okay, fine. Melanie says easy, Nilab says easy. Let's just say it's difficult, okay. Okay, guys, I, uh, this is, I would say, I, I would play somewhere more than 650, but close less than 700, I would say. Uh, there is uh, a lot of traps, a lot of common mistakes which I've seen people make, uh, which I think makes sense for me to discuss. I think I have it in my, uh, I have a certain, um, I have the takeaway in the form of a diagram, but very quickly, let me just talk about a few things first. Now, can anyone tell me how, uh, if I know uh, the coordinate as zero comma minus two and the coordinate uh, as zero comma three, how do I find out the distance uh, between P and Q. Can anyone tell me how do I find out the distance between P and Q if I know the, the coordinates of these two points? Anyone can tell me the formula? And Nikhil, don't worry, I'll talk about the, uh, I'll talk about these, uh, the uh, right answer. Don't worry about it. How do you find out the distance between uh, the two points? Uh, Pavan, you're talking in general, uh, which is correct in this case, the difference of the y coordinates. Uh, but in general, the distance formula is uh, uh, root over x2 minus x1 whole square plus y2 minus y1 whole square. So those of you who do not know it, kindly make a note of it that you don't make a mistake. Now, in this case, the good part is the x coordinates are both zero. So they are kind of irrelevant in this case. Okay, if I take y2, which is three, minus y1 now notice there's a minus here and there's a minus here also so this minus of minus would give you a plus so if i do the square root i'll get three minus of minus plus five square which is equal to five okay so i now know that the distance between the line segment p and q is five units okay that means obviously this one is true come what may this one will definitely be true. Now let's come to the other two cases and I'm going to directly use uh, the, the takeaway slides to help explain because uh, it's kind of difficult to draw the diagram. Uh, so the second statement is area of the right angle triangle, area of the right angle triangle PQ, uh, area of the right angle triangle with PQ as the hypotenuse is six. So I'm looking for a triangle with, with PQ here as the hypotenuse and I'm saying that the area of this is six units. This is what I'm saying, right? A lot of you, um, those of you especially marked the answer as E, uh, said that this is actually correct. Okay, now let's talk about that uh, first very quickly. Now keep in mind if the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle is five, okay, it does not really mean that the three sides are three, four, five. Well, I've seen a lot of people make this mistake. They see a right angle triangle with a hypotenuse given as five. And what they think is, hey, if this is five, then I'm, I'm dealing with a triplet three, four, five always. And this is wrong. Please keep in mind, this is wrong. Unless until you're not given two sides, two lengths basically, 
uh, it is wrong to infer anything about the triplet. So for example, if I tell you one of the length is five, uh, three, the hypotenuse is five, then I don't have a problem if you end up saying, okay, uh, the, the middle one has to be four, then that's absolutely correct. That's not a problem. But if you're just given five, say for example, or if you're just given, hey, there's a right angle triangle with one of the length is as, as three, that doesn't mean the other two sides will be four and five. If you make, if you make such assumption, that's wrong. And here's an example. Uh, of uh, of a case where the hypotenuse is still five, but the uh, the lengths are totally different. So if five by root two, five by root two, uh, if the two sides are five by root two, five by root two, then also you get the hypotenuse as five. Okay. So in this case, if if we would have had a triplet, then I would have my area as three times uh, this base times height six. This is correct. But there could be a case like this also. Where the other two sides are not three and in this case the area is not going to be six so notice i'm getting two different answers and since i'm getting two different answers that is why let me go back very quickly this statement is not sufficient second one is not true not always true i'm looking for must be true i'll say this is not must be true kind of statement Okay, so I'm bringing back here. Look at this. Tell me if you have any doubts. Uh, I'll pause here for a moment. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. If it's perfectly clear, please mark yes. What is the main learning here which I wanted to give you from statement two? The main learning is that if one of the sides is given as five, don't assume the other to be three and four unless and until you know the length of any other side also. Okay. Uh, a lot of people make a mistake. If they see the hypotenuse as 10, they think it's 6, eight, 10, 6, 8, 10, which is wrong. So don't make these assumptions. Okay, I can see it's clear to all of you, except for 5% uh, people, 4% in fact are saying no. So if, if you have any doubts, please post in the uh, chat box. Okay, Vikram has a question. Can we reject statement two because we don't know the coordinate? Th that is also a valid way of uh, removing it, Vikram. You know only two coordinates. You don't know the third one, where exactly it is. So uh, you won't be able to find out the area. So that's also perfectly valid, Vikram. You can do that, not a problem at all. Okay. Now let's come to the third statement. Uh, a lot of you marked the answer as, about 37% of you marked the answer as D. So you said the statement number three is true. So let's look at it. Statement three is saying that the diameter of the circle pass, passing through the point P and Q is five. So they're saying the diameter of a circle which passes through these two points is five. Okay. Now, after discussing statement two, how many of you still think that this statement is sufficient or this statement is true? Uh, so Shivam has a question, if it is given that the values are integers, then can we assume three and four? Uh, Shivam, yes, uh, as far as triplet is concerned, three, four, five can only give a triplet. Are there no other integers? No, I don't think there are any more into one, 24, no. Yeah, you can assume, Shiv assume that Shivam, yes, you can do that. Okay, Vikram is saying not true. Are you saying it for the third statement? It is not true. So Ganda says true. Okay, I'm getting contradictory answers here now. Okay. This is a very interesting statement, by the way, and this is where visualization, I believe, comes into picture a lot. Okay, if a circle is passing through two points P and Q, okay, it is not necessary that that two points will become the diameter of the circle. They have, the, the statement is just tell, asking you: Is it always true that if the if the circle passes through the point P and Q, then that would be the diameter? Then uh, then the answer is no. And I've drawn two diagrams here to help you understand this. So this is one of the diagrams where the where the circle is actually passing through uh, P and Q, as you can see here. It's passing through P and Q. So that this is so in this case it's a diameter. But there could be a case like this also, right? Notice here also the circle is passing through P and Q, but it is not a diameter. Is this part clear?
No, yeah. Uh, so I can see most of you are saying not true, which is good. So, but I hope you understand the explanation here. The statement is uh, the the question is is this true or not? A lot of students, what they do is they start thinking they they start believing in it. They think no, no, this definitely has to be true. The question is which of the following must be true? So you have to validate it. How do you validate it? Obviously, you have to try and see whether you can draw this diagram or not. And you also need to check whether you can draw an alternating diagram also or not, where it is not the diameter. The moment you get two different cases, the moment you say this is not true. Just in the way of in the, in the case of triangle, where I drew two triangles with different lengths to come to the conclusion that statement two is not true. In the same way, for the third one also, you need to draw it to understand clearly that PQ cannot be the uh, diameter always. Okay. Any questions here, guys? Please feel free to ask. Okay, I can see people are saying that they fell for the trap, which is okay. See, the, 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 that's the reason I told you. This is the reason for the session. If you're falling for the trap, that's totally okay. But look at it, a 657 level question and uh, only 39% of you could get it correct. And majority of you got it wrong, which is totally again. I'm saying okay, but make sure that you remember these. What are, what are, what is the main learning out here? No assumption. Make sure you don't assume. Once again, I'm repeating it. Don't assume. Always draw. Always try to be kind of. Uh, I would say uh, be uh, always try to be on the lookout of negating the the statement. Don't always try to prove it. So if they if they saying must be true, don't only look for must be true uh, conditions. Also check if there's a way that it cannot be true. Also, then only will you be able to figure out uh, 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 maybe a solution which is not satisfying it. Okay. So I hope this is perfectly clear. I don't see any more questions in the chat box. Uh, Vikram says I fell for the trap in statement three, but realized the mistake the moment you mentioned visualize. Okay. Uh, well, it's good that you found found this lesson uh, lesson great, but uh, I hope you make sure that you don't repeat these mistakes again, everyone. Okay. Okay. Now let's go to the fourth question quickly. This is the fourth one. This is kind of slightly easier than the previous ones. I, I expect most of you to get this one correct at least. Okay, guys, you've already taken two and a half minutes. I'm giving you another 30 seconds. I know uh, you might, some of you might find this slightly calculation intensive. So I'll give you another 30 seconds. Okay, last 10 seconds. I'm going to end the poll now. So anyone who wants to mark it very quickly, please do so. Okay. Well, 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 uh, I see a good split in this case also, which is kind of surprising. Uh, 
Okay, first let me do jot down because I, I'll be I'll be needing the poll. So let me just write down the numbers. Thirty nine percent of you think that the answer should be A. Thirty one percent of you, thirty percent of you, in fact, think that the answer should be D. And I have about fifteen percent. So it's almost like the previous question, I would say, where the split is same. But in this case, I have about fifteen percent who think the answer should be B and C also. Okay, Sanjit is saying uh, couldn't understand it yet. Okay, Sanjit saying okay, that's totally okay. Um, I I said that this could be easy for a few of you, uh, especially those of you who have attended the uh, quadratic inequality sessions and those who have gone through quadratic inequality. Uh, they should not have a lot of problem solving this kind of question. Okay, but what about the uh, what about uh, the others? Uh, those who maybe not have not done quadratic inequalities. How did you find this question? Was it too difficult for you? Anyone? How was the question? Lipsa says answer is A. Okay, we'll get to that. Lipsa, we'll figure out whether the answer is A or D or E. We'll get get to it. Jigesh says it was difficult. Pawan says medium. Okay, what about the others? I needed few seconds more. Okay, so okay, we'll talk about how you can solve this question uh, quickly. Uh, Shivam says 657. So, guys, uh, as far as the difficulty level is concerned, I will still put it in a 700 level question. The reason I'm doing so is because a lot of people are not comfortable with quadratic inequality, making uh, making calculation mistakes, making mistakes with signs, a lot of stuff. Those who understand quadratic inequality really well, uh, this this question can be solved well within two and a half minutes. I would say, um, if you don't make any mistakes at all. Calculation mistakes. Okay, so let's talk about this question very quickly. The question stem is very easy. There's not much to do except that they're telling me x is a positive integer. So I'll write that down. Positive integer. Okay, I need to find out whether x is prime or not. Now keep in mind, in uh, in GMAT, DS are two. There are two kind of DS questions. I'm sure by now you must know that one is the what is the value of x. One is a yes no type of question. So this it belongs to a yes no type of question. Okay, is x prime? You need to answer either yes or no. As long as you can answer, that particular statement will turn out to be sufficient. If you cannot answer, then that statement is not sufficient. Okay, so this is all the very basics of data sufficiency that you should definitely know. Now we'll move to the first statement. There's nothing else that we can do uh, except for this. So x to the power five minus five x to the power four. Plus 4x cube is less than zero. Now this might look very difficult, but if you notice, you can take x cube common out of this. You'll get x square minus 5x plus 4 is less than zero. X cube we can keep it like this, and notice x square minus 5x plus 4. This is a quadratic equation which can be broken down like this. Again, I'm doing it for everybody. Ideally, uh, if you are comfortable with quadratic equation. You should be able to do this step in one go, uh, or two steps instead of three. The way I'm writing it down, you should be able to do it in three steps, not more than uh, two steps, not more than that. So finally, notice what I'm getting here is x cube, x minus one, x minus four is less than zero. Okay. Now those of you who uh, have gone through the as I told you, quadratic inequality session or video lesson in our course, you know, and uh, and in the session we have told you, Pish must have told you that x cube, the the nature of x cube, and the nature of x remains the same. So what you need to do is first of all draw the zero points on a number line. So how do you get the zero points? X cube equal to zero means x equal to zero. That's the first zero point. X minus one equal to zero means x equal to one. That's the second zero point. Okay, I should draw it like this. That would be better. 0 1 and x minus 4 is is equal to 0 so x equal to 4 that's the third zero point again ideally you should be able to do this mentally but if you make calculation mistakes it makes sense to write them down so that you don't once you do this uh, hopefully most of you by now know that what we do is you put an alternating sign here plus minus plus minus and since we are looking for less than 0 that means you're looking for values for which values of x for which this is negative we will be focusing on uh, this range out here. This is one range, and this is the other. 
Now tell me, are both the range valid? Uh, both the range is valid. Let me write down the range is x is less than zero, and x lies between one and four. Can anyone tell me, are both the ranges uh, correct, or should we consider both the ranges or not? That's the question. Should we consider both the ranges? Yes, no. Okay, Lavey says no. And can you tell me why should we not consider it? Yes, very good. X must be positive. So see, that's the constraint. If you write it down on a piece of paper, you'll know, hey, it's a positive integer. So X less than zero, I don't need to consider that range. So let me discard it. This is the only case. Another thing, some of you may say, hey, it's a range. I might not get the answer, but look at it. It's an integer. So obviously the value of X between two and four is only, uh, between one and four is only two and three. Okay. Notice how using the constraints, I was able to figure out what are the possible values of X. Now here, a lot of you may make the mistake that, a lot of you may make the mistake here. Andrew, that'll answer your question. Just give me one sec. A lot of you may, may make the mistake in DS by thinking that, hey, I'm getting two values of X. So maybe this statement is not sufficient. And believe me, I've seen people make this mistake. And if you're one of them, please make sure that you don't do this mistake again. This question is not about finding the value of X. I told you, you know, there are two kinds of question. What is X and is X prime? So if the question would have been, what is the value of X? You could have discarded this statement saying, hey, there are two values, not sufficient. But the question is simply asking you, is X prime or not? Is it prime or not? Yes or no? Now, I don't care what is the value of X, either two or three, but I know whatever be it, it is going to be prime only. Both of them are prime. So my answer to this question using statement one would be yes, X is prime. Is this part clear or not? Please mark yes if this is perfectly clear. Uh, let me bring up the poll very quickly. Okay, Anurud is asking, how did you get that X should be greater than one? We only know that X. Okay, Anurud, what's your full question? Uh, Anurud, first of all, whether it's important to know, uh, tell me whether you know number line method or not. If you don't know number line method, then it will be slightly difficult for you to solve this question. Then I would suggest going through the inequality number line method. Then you'll understand this pro properly. Okay, I can see 94% of you are saying uh, they have 88% uh, now. They have understood this. If there are 10% who are still saying no, if you have any questions, please ask in the chat box. Anirudh, uh, we are not saying that X is less than one. We are saying X lies between one and four. And this is the other range. See, this is a less than zero. Less than zero means negative. So when I draw the number line, I only focus on areas which are negative. I discard the places which are positive. And that becomes my range. So this is going X less than zero. And this is between one and four. Okay, Anirudh, so what's your questions? I still don't get it. Uh, uh, do you have a problem with the number line or do you, do you have the problem with the zero points? What's exactly is the issue? What about the others? Uh, do you have any other questions apart from this? Anirudh, I'll definitely answer. Can you just frame it properly? What exactly you're asking and I'll answer your question. Okay, I don't see any other questions. I just frame your question in one go and let me know. I'll definitely come back to your question and answer it, okay? So guys, you've understood that this statement is sufficient. So let's move on to the next statement very quickly. And Anurudh, I'll answer your question. Please post it once more properly. In this case, also, you're going to do the same thing. Okay, bring it to the other side like this. Again, notice I can take x to the power 5 common. So x squared minus x minus 12 is less than 0. And here you can write this as minus 4x plus 3x minus 12 less than 0. You'll get x minus 4, x plus 3 is less than 0. Again, I did once, I skipped one step here, but I hope that's okay. Once again, you'll mark your zero points. x to the power 5 equal to 0 means x equal to 0. Again, I, I'll write this down so that there's no scope of confusion. The second zero point is x equal to 4. Okay, let me do it this way. And the third zero point is x equal to minus 3. Once again, I'll do a plus, minus, plus, minus. The range that I'm getting here is X is greater than X, less than four, and X is less than minus three. Once again, I know it's a positive integer, so I'll discard this case. I'll say, hey, this case is not valid. 
the only thing is this. But notice an interesting thing here. You have three values here, one, two, and three. Now tell me, is this statement sufficient? Can anyone tell me in the chat box, is this statement sufficient? And if no, why not? Uh, okay, I'll keep on answering some of the questions which I have at the bottom. Uh, why is X more than one? Uh, where have I taken X more than one, guys? Usman says, can we divide the entire equation by X to the power five? No, Usman, we cannot do that because in an inequality, we don't know the sign of X to the power. Uh, oh, it's a positive equation. Yes, you can, by the way. Yes, in this case, it's a positive integer. So if you want, you can divide it, Usman. You can do that. It's a positive integer. So definitely you can divide it by X to the power five. Had we not known it's a positive integer, Usman, then we could not have done just to be very clear here. Okay. Uh, no, Anurudh, you're making a mistake here. We, we we are not saying that x minus 1 is less than 0. Keep in mind, this whole expression is less than 0. Now, it's quite possible, and I'm looking for values of x which makes it less than 0. Okay, values of x. This I'm not saying that individually this expression is less than 0, just to be very clear here, Usma, Anirudh. I hope that answers your query. Okay. Okay, now coming back to this, I can see that all of you uh, have answered the, uh, the question correctly that one is not a prime number, right? So a lot of you may make this mistake by thinking one is prime and very quickly mark the answer as D, but that is where you'll falter. So since you have one here, the answer would be no. Two and three, the answer is yes. Since you're getting two different answers for statement two, that is why you'll say statement two is not sufficient. Okay, so I hope this is perfectly clear, guys. Uh, once again, we'll share the recordings. If you have any doubts, you can ask in the YouTube channel also. Uh, that's not a problem. But if there's some high level doubts, please make sure to ask them in the chat box. I'll clear it now. So I'll go back here. So guys, notice about 30% of you chose the answer as D. So I hope now you've understood the mistake. If this was a mistake of taking one as a prime number, make sure that you never make this mistake. I saw a few of you marking the answer E directly after seeing the question. Okay, some of you just very quickly looked at the question and said, hey, it has to be E. Now, if you were in that category, please keep in mind that that's wrong. Just because it's it's an inequality, that doesn't mean that we won't get a unique value. A lot of people think that way. That's wrong. Okay. You need to solve that inequality and figure out whether you can get a unique answer or not. And as I told you, this is a yes, no kind of question. So we are not looking for a unique value. In a yes, no question, we just need to answer yes or no. If it's an inequality, don't always think that you cannot get the answer. If you fall under that category, make sure to solve. Please solve the question and then decide whether you can get the answer or not. Okay. And last learning is if it's a what is the type of what is the value kind of question, DS question, where it says what is X or what is the value of X, then only and only then you look for a unique value. Okay. So I hope this is perfectly clear. If you have any doubts, please ask. Okay, where did I write 3n? I did not write 3n anywhere. This is x. These are all x, guys. Apologies if my handwriting is a little difficult to read, but these are all x. Okay, one final time, guys. Please mark uh, yes if this is perfectly clear, and then I'll move on to the fifth question. So keep in mind conceptually also I told you in starting that you might get inequality questions where if you're not conceptually good, you may make a mistake. So this could be a learning for those of you who think uh, they know inequality and they still got the question wrong. That means you need to devise maybe once more, go through the number line method properly so that you get these questions correct. So and Lipsa also, I hope you saw that if you write things methodically, it does not take a lot of time to solve the question. As you, as you, as you may have noticed, two minutes, two and a half minutes, that's the max that you need to get it correct. Okay. Okay. Now let's move on to the fifth question.
I've added the poll. Okay, 15 seconds, guys. Uh, we have already crossed the two minute limit. Okay, I'm going to end the poll now. So, those of you who want to mark the answer, please do so very quickly. Okay, so I've ended the poll. It took about two and a half minutes to do this question, which is perfectly okay. I would say that that is the amount of time that it needs to be done. And again, you fell, those of you who fell for the trap, I'm not going to tell what the answer is, but you fell for the typical CE trap in this question. When I say CE trap, what I mean by that is you, uh, I'm not saying that both of them are incorrect, but people can't decide which one to mark the answer as and either they, are, if they are able to fully solve, they get the answer correct, else they end up choosing either C or E to mark the answer. But now I want to show you if you, and, and this, is a, this is a kind of question which is kind of testing your uh, simplification skill, as well as how well you can infer. If you are good at simplification and inference, then questions like these might be slightly easy. If, if you are slightly lagging in this, then there's a high chance that you may make mistakes, especially in difficult questions. Okay, so let's let's start by discussing what are they asking in this question. The question is, did John save at least 18% less in February than in January? So I'm talking about in February, did he save 18% less when it compared to Jan? Obviously, I cannot do much here. I can all I can do is write this on my paper. And see, guys, I'm solving it the way I would have solved on, on a piece of paper. I could have easily highlighted everything and started solving the question, but no. This is what I would have written on my piece of paper when solving the question, okay? I cannot do anything else, so I'll move on to the first statement. The first statement is, John's monthly income in February was 18% less than his monthly income in January. Okay, so let me write down Jan, Feb, and I'm talking about income. And this is where, guys, sometimes you'll notice uh, it's important to preempt also that if I'm talking about savings, if I'm talking about income, there's a high chance that I may end up getting some expenditure information also. So either you can very quickly skim through if you if you want to, whether you have income expenditure or not, or obviously you can go one by one also. That's totally okay. But most of the questions we're dealing with savings, income, there's always an expenditure involved. Okay. Now, see, I've been told that the monthly income of February is 18% less. So if in January he was making an income of X, okay, in February he's making 18% less. So I'm writing it down for everybody to, for, the, for this uh, to be clear to everyone. But this is what I'm going to write, 18% less than what was in January. So this is what he is earning in February, okay? So I hope this is perfectly clear. Now, those of you marked A, some of you did that, I hope you understand just knowing the income is not enough. Okay, what you what I need here is to find out the expend, uh, the expenditure also so that I can get the net net savings. Savings is, is what? Savings is basically income minus expenditure. So I'm looking at this number. Okay, so obviously statement one is not sufficient. I'll go to statement two. Now notice statement two itself also won't be sufficient because now we are just talking about expenditure again. So in this case, I would say uh, the monthly expenditure in February is 15% less. Now, don't make the mistake of taking this also as X. Expenditure is different from income. So if you want to take, you take this as Y, and you say that this is 15% less. Okay. 
Okay, so I hope this is clear. And now, obviously, this statement is not sufficient. So you can find out the savings. The savings for January is going to be x minus y. The saving for February is going to be 0.82x minus point. And again, I'm doing all this so that this is perfectly clear. This is what is the saving is. The question is, as you can see, saving in February, is it less in January uh, by at least 18%? So what they're asking me to do is find the difference of savings, January, February. I'm looking for a percentage. Okay, if I'm looking for a percentage, I need to have something in the denominator. Can anyone tell me in the denominator, will I have savings of January or savings of February? Can anyone tell me? Samyak is asking, can we assume X as 100? Samyak, yes, you can assume X as 100. That's not a problem. You can take a X as 100. But since there were two variables involved here, uh, taking both as 100, 100 is not correct. Just to let you know. That's why I did not... Uh, uh, I didn't, didn't take any values uh, as such in this case. Okay, so Shweta is saying Feb, uh, Anirudh is saying Jan, Lavesh Jan, Sunil Jan. Okay, here's a thumb rule, guys. Please keep in mind that whenever they say Dan something, that basically becomes a, ref a reference point. So the reference point is January here. So I'm basically looking for this, SJ minus SF by SJ times 100. So what I'll do is I'm going to the next slide very quickly and I'm writing it down. I'll, I'll copy it from the previous slide so that it is easy for me to do it. Saving here was X minus Y. This was 0.82X minus 0.85Y by X minus Y times 100. If you subtract these two, you'll get 0.18X minus of minus plus and minus y would give you minus 0.15y by x minus y times 100. Now, this is how I manipulate. I leave up to you to decide whether you want to do it in the same way or not. What I basically do is I see 0 0.18, 0 0.15. At this point, a lot of people will say that, hey, uh, it's not possible to get the answer. But what I would suggest, strongly suggest, is to take x minus y common from the numerator by breaking it like this. Notice what I did was I split I um, I split it into two parts. I split it like this, 0.03x uh, again, 0.03x. The way I, why I did this because if I if I split it now, notice I'll get here 0.15x minus y by x minus y, and here I'll get 0.03x by x minus y times 100. And if I solve it and I'm taking it here, guys, really sorry for the lack of space. Notice that this will get canceled out. You multiply it by 100, you get 15%. You multiply it 0 0.03 by 100, you get 3x by x minus y. Now, you're looking for 18%, at least 18% less or not. Now, can you tell me, you already have 15%. Is this value? and I'm writing it in top to be very clear, is this value more than 3% or less than 3%? And be logical, think about it, that X here is the income, Y here is the expenditure. Ketan is asking, why are we taking the percent here and why not the difference? The question is based on 18% less. They're not talking about just uh, $18 or $180. If this would have been a question based on dollars, then I would have taken the difference only. So I hope that answers your question, Ketan. So guys, uh, next question, which I was asking is 3x by x minus y. I think x is the income. x minus y is the difference greater than 3, right? Because x is greater than x, x minus y. This value, obviously, this difference would be less than x by x minus y. Obviously, would be greater than 1 because the income is greater than the expend income is here which is greater than whatever I'm subtracting from. So this value is smaller. So this becomes greater than one, which tells me that this is greater than three, 3%. So net to net, this is greater than 18%. The question is at least 18% less, that means 18 or more. I can say, yes, it is 18% or more. So this statement is definitely sufficient. 
So the correct answer in this case would be option C. So I hope this is clear, guys. I wanted to show you all these steps properly. That is why I took variables to show you how you can simplify it. This is the way you can simplify your equations. And this is how you make an inference uh, of how or whether the value out here, whether it will be greater than 3% or less than 3%. Okay. It looks slightly complicated. So I would strongly suggest that you try out this question once again at your home. Uh, make sure that you are comfortable writing down uh, and and keep in mind whenever you have questions like based on income expenditure savings or say whenever you're dealing with years 2001 2002 those kind of things it always makes sense to write it in a proper table tabular form at least for me it makes much more sense because i can see all my values very clearly so if, I, if there's something else that i need to work with i can look at my table work with it very quickly and it doesn't take a lot of time to do this okay so the correct answer in this case is option uh, X is my income and Y is my expenditure. Okay, so that is why it said X is greater than Y. Unless it would have been stated somewhere that he's not making any saving, he's spent, take, taking money from somewhere. Those things you don't need to consider. Uh, if, if they wanted to take you some other in special cases, they would have mentioned that. So X is greater than Y because X is the income, Y is the expenditure. Uh, this is in fact a GMAT like question. Pooja Shweta is asking what level is this? This is 7 plus level question. I would I would kind of place it somewhere around 750 types. So those of you who are basically targeting Q50, Q51, you can expect these kind of questions in your exam. Uh, Anirudh is asking, I don't understand why savings of January minus savings of February is taken. Anirudh, you can do that also. Here, what what you what, what you're taking what we're taking into account is that we are looking for the value of 18%. Okay, it things won't change if I flip it. Flipping only makes the sign different. So instead of saying instead of saying 18%, I would have said minus 18%. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm consciously taking J minus F by J so that I get a positive value. And I know if since I'm writing J minus F, J is greater than F. I'm keeping that in mind. If you write F minus J, that is not a problem. Anirudh. I hope that answers your query. Uh, yes, guys, I can see a few questions. People are asking that whether you can take uh, values or not. In these kind of questions, I prefer not taking values and uh, doing it variable wise because there are two variables involved. Had this been only a, you can take by the way variable uh, numbers to solve the question because this is a percentage based question. Everything is being asked in percentages, but I would not recommend doing it. Okay, because in some questions where there are two variables involved, a lot can depend on what kind of values are you choosing. So just to be on the same side, it would make much, much more sense if you just take uh, num uh, the variables and solve this question. Okay. Any other questions, anyone? Okay, Usman is asking, it will consume time in exam situation. Guys, yes, it will consume time. But understand, uh, and this is a question I get every time. See, you have 62 minutes for the exam, okay? And you have, say, 31 questions. There'll be about, believe me, if you become good in quant, there will be about five to seven questions which you will be able to solve in one minute. Believe me, there will be. Okay, so whatever additional time that you save here, you'll be saving about five to seven minutes here. You can use that for the difficult five to seven questions that you get at the end, very end, the very hard ones that you get. Uh, you can use this extra time that you're getting for these questions. I am not saying solve this question in two minutes. Remember, there's another question which I told it's okay to take two and a half minutes. This is this is the same kind of question where even if you take three minutes to three and a half minutes, not a problem. Use the time that you save in the initial questions, which are easy ones, and utilize it in these kind of questions. And not just the easy one, wherever there'll be a lot of questions where you'll know exactly what you need to do. Those kind of questions are the questions which you will be able to do it in 1.5 minutes, in less than two minutes, basically. So whatever additional time that you save in those kind of questions should be used in these kind of difficult questions. Okay. Okay, Pooja is asking, can we follow the same logic? Saving is equal to just one sec, guys. Let me make the chat uh, public and private both. It was private for a moment. Yeah. So Pooja is asking, can we follow the same simple logic, income minus expenditure, and get the answer? No, Pooja, uh, we cannot do that. Uh, it is not always necessary that you'll get the answer as C. 
okay this is just one of the cases there could be a case where it could be a touch and go kind of a scenario where you may or may not get the answer we were lucky here that we got three had this been something else if this would have been just x a for example x then we couldn't be sure this could be more than three this could be less than three you will never know so in in such situations it's best to write it down and then solve it but guys you should be happy you now know how to do this so you, the that's the reason i ask you to try it at home once again try it at home once again make sure that you're very comfortable with this but see i know the process so don't take me time to solve this question whenever i get an income expenditure question i write down income minus expenditure for both of them and then based on the question i find out my percentage okay so i hope that answers your query Okay, Lavey says critical methods in mod also. Yeah, so keep in mind, as I told you, there will be five to seven questions where you will take three minutes. Even we do, guys. Even if if we take a mock today, even we will take. There will be about four to five questions where we do take three minutes. Okay, we do. But what I also do is I also make sure that I have at least five to seven questions which I can solve under a minute. that helps me save time that helps me to save that time and use it here you have to develop that thing for yourself only yourself also so if i talk about a few questions like this question you should be able to solve it within 2 minutes question number 4 this question should be solved within 2 minutes i i'll say one and a half minute at the max because you just need to make inferences so you have to decide like look at the first question that we discussed Tell me how much time would you need for this? If you know that these are not parallel, you should be able to solve this question in forty-five seconds, right? You could have said, "Okay, uh, I don't know they are parallel, so this is hundred and ten. This is hundred and ten. I don't know CD. Not possible. Not possible. Mark your answer as E. Move on." So I'm talking about these kind of questions, which are six fifty, six hundred, six fifty level, six hundred level questions, which you will get in the initial phases. You need to save time in these kind of questions, and use it in difficult ones. Okay now uh, without wasting time let's move on to the sixth question guys here's the sixth one and let me bring up the poll Okay, another thirty seconds, guys, and I'm going to end the poll. Ten seconds, then I'm going to end the poll. So I would request all of you to put in your responses. Those if you aren't doing it, please do so. It's okay if you get it wrong. Okay, I'm ending the poll now. And I have forty-one uh, percent of you who think that the answer should be B. B forty-one percent. Okay. Uh, the next contender is E with thirty-one percent. And then I have a few Bs and uh, B, C and Ds about ten percent each. C D. Okay. Now, uh, in this question, uh, first of all, let me ask you your opinion. Would you think that this was difficult? Did you find this difficult? 
you define this easy i know after looking at the answer uh, the answer responses you might be thinking this there has to be some mistake that you might have made but was was it that difficult okay shweta says easy okay what about the others okay yes difficult yes difficult tricky if you know then it's easy yes obviously if you know it's an easy levesh asks is uh, is integer or not okay that's so this is so guys i've like since day one when i've been uh, giving you a, a conducting webinar especially on word problems i've always told you focus on the variables focus and see what x and y are always we have a tendency of always assuming the variables to be integers now in this question tell me is it given anywhere that x and y are integers i added my poll pooja says cyclicity concept is used doesn't look like while solving looked easy okay answer my question i'm sure you'll you'll know whether this is easy or not read the question very carefully and tell me do we know that x is x and y that are given to us they are integers okay i have 83% of you who are saying no 15% of you are saying yes so guys please keep in mind uh, those of you who are saying yes read it very carefully they are just saying that x and y are greater than one nothing else x and y greater than one that's all and obviously i we have x plus y equal to 4 but the information that we have these two information in no way indicates that x and y are integers it doesn't if you make such inferences you're making a mistake make a note of it make sure that you never repeat it again if x and y are greater than 1 who is stopping me from taking values like this say 1.75 2.25 or say 1.5 2.5 right or maybe one point say uh, take whatever you want say for example 1.451 uh, 2.55 if you want to take right nobody is stopping us from taking any values because they are just they're saying x and y are greater than 1 so i'm i'm open i just need to make sure they are both open than 1 uh, more than 1 and the other thing which i need to keep in mind is that the sum should be 4 which i am maintaining here now the mistake that most of you made in this question was the moment you saw x and y greater than 1 x plus y equal to 4 or a lot of you jumped to the conclusion that this has to be 2 this has to be 2 and solve the question how many of you did this mark yes obviously from the poll i do have an idea how many of you did that but i hope you understand the mistake guys uh, 41% of you marked the answer as b okay So, forty-one uh, percent of you simply assume that they have to be integers. I think you thought two to the power four, six to the power three. Uh, uh, in fact, I'll tell you another interesting thing here also, which you will uh, uh, appreciate here. In this case, notice one interesting thing. Okay, if x is an integer, if x would have been an integer, okay, would have been. Let me add that. Then. notice i really this information really is kind of redundant there's no need of this information if it would have been integer okay the reason is for example 75428x plus 4 uh, and when you're finding the unit digit you're just worried about the unit digit notice 8x plus 4 if you're looking at the cyclicity is completely divisible by 4 so if x would have been an integer technically there is no need of x as such there's no use of x you could have simply said hey the power is completely divisible by 4 so the cyclicity completes itself fully so it has to be 2 to the power 4 so it has to be 6 same goes for 4396 the cyclicity of 6 if x if y is an integer is 6 so what's the use of y there's no use of y as such if it would have been integer again i'm repeating it again and again this would have been 6 6 plus 6 is 12 so the answer should have been 2 so you should have asked yourself 
this looks easy and at and frankly the value of x and y is not making an impact so what's the use of giving this information why was i given this information that is how you need to question yourself guys okay if the, if you have 100% conceptual clarity about these things you would have noticed that 8x plus 4 technically is sufficient to answer the question if x is an integer and same goes for y but since i've been given some information about x and y they must the gmat must be playing with something out here right so if, since we don't know what whether it's an integer or not we cannot be sure that the answer will always be two the moment we change it to some other variable okay 0 0.3 0 0.4 now we are dealing in decimals and the value could be anything but i'm looking for a must be condition it's a must be true kind of condition the answer obviously we cannot find a unique answer in this case since we cannot find a unique answer in this case the answer would be none of these i hope this is clear guys please keep in mind i'm reiterating again don't assume anything about the variables unless or until you they specifically state that it's a positive integer okay x and y could have been anything in this case okay so if nothing is mentioned about the variable what i do as a general practice is i i ensure i think about all the possible cases i simply write if nothing is mentioned i simply take it as real numbers by the way uh, but if you have to divide and think in this way, you can think in this way that it could be a positive number, it could be a negative number, it could be a fraction, it could be an integer, anything is possible if nothing is mentioned about the variable. In a general, I'm talking about. If you are given x and y are greater than one, and if nothing is mentioned, then at least these three cases will be possible. So you should be able to infer this in the exam. If you're not able to may infer in this exam, then you'll make a mistake. So Lipsa is saying, so answer should be, no, Lipsa, the answer won't be to, why will the answer be to? The answer would have been to if I would have known X and Y are integers. I don't know whether X and Y are integers. If, if X and Y are not integers, the cyclicity works when the powers are integers. When the cyclicity isn't there, then it's an open game. The, the unit digit can change and can be anything because now you're dealing with fractions and decimals. It's not necessary that six to the power any fraction will always give you six only. Are you getting my point? Think about it. Think about six to the power one by two, square root of six, basically. Think about it. The size, if the unit digit is not six, in that case, if I look at root six, six to the power one by two, just to give you one example very quickly, when I have a fraction power, in this case, you get two point something, 2.4 or 2.45, something like this. So see the unit digit changes the moment we have a fraction as a power. So I hope Lipsa, this now, this, now it's perfectly clear. Vikram is asking if the answer can, was can be instead of must be then. Uh, Vikram, you won't get this question, by the way, in the form of can be, just to be very clear, because it's an open game that, yes, it is quite possible that all three options might be possible. But GMAT will not give you a question which you won't be valid, you won't be able to validate in the exam, right? In this case, I will have to say, hey, I think all three are possible uh, because any value can be put in. So they don't make such questions like that. So uh, rest assured, you won't get a can be question uh, in this format, never. Okay, so guys, one last time, putting a yes/no poll. Please let me know if this is perfectly clear. If you still have doubts, uh, that, that's okay. Curiosity is good, Vikram. Um, curiosity is good. That's not a problem. Uh, let me know if this is clear. Please mark yes. Okay, I can see it's clear to everyone, which is good. So let's go to the last question for today. And here's the last one. Guys, look scary, but believe me, it's not. So let me bring up the poll, and here's the poll, guys. By the way, I'm going to share the PDF also, so wait till the end, because the PDF will have uh, additional questions which you can practice, OK?
Okay, so answers have started to pour in, which is good. I'm giving just 30 seconds more. So those of you are still simplifying it. Uh, you have 30 seconds more. And then I'll start the discussion. Okay, 10 seconds more, then I'm going to end the poll. I'm going to end the poll now. Wow, <laughs> you should see the poll, guys. 33% of you think that the answer should be A, but after that, again, okay, I have 29% also, but 29%, 16%, 12%, it's all over the place. So it kind of makes me give, it gives me an idea that uh, you may be guessing, some of you, uh, did you find this question difficult, guys? How many of you found it difficult? Okay, while I'm waiting for the response, let me just jot down the expression uh, because I'll have a hard time solving it. Oh, okay, let me do it separately. Uh, I'll do it later on. Okay, uh, Shweta says easy, but simplification makes it difficult. Jigesh says difficult. Time consuming, time consuming. Okay, okay. Okay, what I'll do is I'll try and try to solve this question as I would have, again, as I told you, uh, as I solve in the exam. And I'll show you if you know how to simplify a factorial properly, uh, you will be able to do this question, this question specifically under two minutes uh, easily. If you don't make any calculation mistake, I know I'm putting a lot of ifs, but uh, the question is basically based on the concept of uh, breaking down factorials. How do you break a factorial down? Okay, I'm going to take a very simple example to help you explain what I mean by breaking the factorial. Uh, some of you may already know this. But see, understand, uh, I'm taking five factorial because it's, uh, it's, it would be easy to help you understand. Five factorial is basically what? One, two, three, four, five. Multiplication of five numbers. Now, notice if I want, I can club this part here, one, two, three, four, and write five factorial as four factorial times five. Okay, how many of you knew this, that you can break down a factorial by writing a like this. So for example, four factorial can be written as you take out the four and you write three factorial times five. How many of you knew this? And uh, I hope this is clear now. So how many of you knew this? You can, you can put in your response in the uh, chat box, but whether this is clear or not, please mark yes in the poll. If this is clear, mark yes. Okay, Lipsa says new, Sai says new, Vivens is new. Okay, but uh, those of you who did not know, is this part clear? The process is very simple. You, what you do is you just, uh, if you have a, a factorial, you just write out that number and just take one number below it and write it as a factorial. This is the concept that I'm going to use here to solve the question. So if I have n factorial, what I do is I write n. Okay, what is one number below n? It is n minus one, right? So I'll write n times n minus one factorial. If I want to break it down again, I'll write n. I'll write n minus one as is. I want to go one below this, which is n minus two. So I'll say times n minus two factorial and so on. So this is something which should be perfectly clear to everybody, especially when you're dealing with variables. With numbers, I know most of you are able to do it very quickly, okay? But with variables also, you should be uh, perfectly uh, comfortable working with it. Now, why I'm saying this is because if I, and if I take this expression by expression, okay, I'll take uh, first P plus one factorial by P minus two factorial 
times p minus one. Let me take this one first. Okay. Now what I'll do is I can see p minus two is less than p plus one. So I'll break this down. I'll write p plus one times p factorial. I'm going one down from p plus one. If I go one down, it will be p. If I go another one down, I'll get p minus one. If I go another one down, I'll get p minus two. Right. So I'll let p plus one p p minus one p minus two factorial divided by p minus two factorial times p minus one. And notice p minus two factorial and p minus one gets cancelled out. So in the first case, you are just left with p times p plus one. So I'll pause here so that uh, I can ask you whether this is clear or not, because everything depends on this. The rest of the stuff that I have to do is all on uh, going to be like this only. This is clear. Please mark yes. So I noticed I had a p minus two. If you're asking me why I did this, I did this because I saw p minus two in the denominator, p minus two factorial. So I split the numerator in such a way that I get a p minus two factorial and the rest are there as is. Okay, let me say it's clear. Most of the people are saying clear, so I'm moving on. So let's go to the second uh, second case uh, and let me write it down on the extreme right. P factorial by P minus three factorial times P minus two. I notice a P minus three here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep on splitting it. P, P minus one, P minus two times P minus three factorial. I'll stop here the moment I get the factorial that I need. And notice p minus three factorial p minus two gets cancelled out, and you're left with p times p minus one. Notice how fast I'm being able to do this because I'm very comfortable with variables. I know how to go down below one variable or move up one variable. Okay, especially when I'm splitting my factorials. If you still have doubts, I can see ten percent people are saying no. Please ask questions, guys. That's totally okay. Last case. P p plus one factorial by P minus one factorial times five. Okay, I have a five. Great, but I have a P minus one. So I'll write down this as P plus one, P, P minus one factorial by P minus one factorial times five. Again, P minus one factorial, but they'll cancel out. I'll be left with P times P plus one by five. So let me simplify it. I'll get P square plus P minus P square plus P is equal to P square plus P. By five. This is two p multiplied by five would give you ten p is equal to p square plus p, or you get p square minus nine p is equal to zero. You take p common. So either p can be zero or p can be nine. But there's one thing which I did not talk about in the starting is making sure that you are comfortable with the uh, the constraint. What is the constraint? Those of you who said statement one is not sufficient, forget the forgot the constraint. The constraint is it is greater than five. It has it is a positive integer. That means I can discard this case, and I can say the value of p is equal to nine. So statement one is sufficient. Any doubts, anyone? Please ask. Notice. The question seems lengthy, but if you're able to break it down the way I've done it, it, it becomes really, really easy to do it. OK, any other questions? Oh, by the way, we could have canceled out P also. Somebody's pointing at that. Yes, since P is a positive integer, if you would have wanted instead of multiplying it, you could have crossed out P in the starting also if you wanted to. That's totally OK. Here also, I could have directly canceled it out. The reason I don't do it is because people take it in the other way and they think they can do it every time. That's why I don't do it. OK, but uh, you can cancel it if you remember the constraint. It's a positive integer. There's no harm in doing it. OK, now let's come to the second statement. I hope I have space. Yeah, I have it. Good. So let's look at the first one uh, and the second statement P plus one factorial by P minus one factorial times P plus one. So I'll break it down like this P plus one times P times P minus one factorial. Why? Because I have P minus one in the denominator. This will get cancelled out. This will get cancelled out and be left with P. So this becomes P. OK, let's look at the next one. P factorial divided by P minus two factorial by P minus one. Once again, P P minus one, P minus two factorial 
by p minus 1 times p minus 2 factorial. So notice uh, here also I'm getting p. So the left hand side is 2p. Okay. Let's look at the right hand side. 3p minus 1 factorial. Okay. This looks uh, slightly weird. Let's see what this is. 3p factorial. Okay. Now notice uh, this one's smaller. This one's greater. So I will now break, do the breaking part in the denominator. So this should be perfectly clear that you have to write it like this. Some of you may very quickly might try to break this one up, but you should very clearly see 3p is here. One less than this is 3p minus 1. So it makes sense to break this one. So you'll cancel out 3p minus 1, 3p minus 1. You'll cancel out one of the p's. You'll cancel out 2. So you'll be left with 2 and 1p. So the right hand side is also 2p. So notice from this statement, you cannot find out the value of p because the left hand side, right hand side becomes the same. 2p is equal to 2p. So what is p? You cannot find it out. It's like basically saying a 2p minus 2p is equal to 0. So you don't know what p is. You can never figure out the value of p from this statement. Okay. Since you cannot figure out the value from this statement, this statement will be not sufficient. The first one was sufficient. So the correct answer in this case will be option a lipsa that's uh, 3p okay uh, some of you might have got confused my bad i should have put a bracket here so some of you might have thought this as 3 times p factorial no this is basically 3p factorial i should have given a bracket guys so I did not expect that you might have got confused. So let's say if you got confused because of this, apologies for that. But uh, what I really meant was 3p factorial, OK? So if you solved using uh, p factorial, then that's a different, uh, totally different thing altogether, Lipsa. OK? OK, Pooja is saying it's clear. Uh, uh, Vikram saying infinite solution uh, seems time consuming. Yeah, see, it looks time consuming, by the way, but uh, it's not, as you can see. If you understand the expressions, variables properly, you should be able to do this very quickly. Okay, so guys, uh, I'm, uh, let me share the PDF with you. Uh, I've already talked about this, so let me move on. Uh, I'm going to talk about two things very quickly. One is the next two webinars that we are going to happen which is on modifiers on 16th and uh, there's a PNC uh, uh, session also on the 22nd which will be taken by uh, Piyush. Piyush will be taking that session. Okay, uh, let me share the PDF. I have shared the PDF guys. You should be able to see it. The other thing which I wanted to talk about very quickly was what Piyush talked about, uh, about the crash course. Uh, I just wanted to show you the uh, the sessions that we are going to conduct in a more methodical way because unfortunately Piyush could not show that. So if you have about two minutes, if I can take two minutes of yours, uh, I think it would be great if you can see it. So uh, obviously the link is there in the chat box. I think everybody can see it. Okay. What I wanted to show you here was that guys in this six weeks course uh, crash course that we are going to conduct we are going to conduct 25 sessions so obviously you can go through it once and here what we have done is we have uh, posted the session calendar also so I would strongly suggest that you look at it once uh, if you are interested in preparing with us especially you want to take it in the next two months uh, the difference between the sessions that we are taking now and the session that you're going to conduct uh, later on uh, in this crash course. The main difference is that now I'm just doing questions, assuming that you know certain things, okay? But the main difference which will come here is that for each and every session, there's a particular agenda, particular topic that I'm going to cover. Okay, as you can see, uh, Sunita is going to cover uh, subject verb pairs, uh, each and every topic, if you notice in quant, in verbal, Everything is being properly covered one by one, one by one topic wise in each and every two hour session. And the best part here would be that you will be going, you'll, you'll obviously get access to the uh, video courses. So for example, if there's a session on percentage ratio proportion, you will be going through it from our course. Okay, and then coming for the session. So that would be much, much more productive because there I can discuss more difficult questions that you can ask your doubts from the course. It's almost like I would say, uh, uh, and uh, a, a very good option for people who say want to take private tutoring but cannot take private tutoring because of the cost. So I would say it's a it's a very optimal cost. Uh, the, the, the 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 cost is not too much, and you are getting 50 hours of uh, classes 
uh, in this. As you can see, everything from SC uh, to CR, if you notice, CR is also getting covered. Each and everything is going to be covered properly. And quant, obviously, you'll notice everything is there now much in much, much more detail. So like last time when I did geometry, I had to skim through geometry a bit. I could do some high level things, but now there will be two dedicated sessions on geometry, four hours on geometry, where I'm going to talk about all different kinds of aspects of all kinds of traps. And I feel it's going to be a good for you because if you go through the course and if you then come for this session, a lot of things which, where you have doubt gets cleared in the session, as well as uh, uh, the learnings get uh, cemented in your mind, basically. So I think it makes sense, uh, especially if you uh, if you want to prepare for uh, for in the next two months, next one month, in the next six weeks, if you want to do well, uh, I would say it's a very good option for you to go with it. So you have the link. Uh, I'm sharing it once again on the chat. Those who cannot see it, uh, I would say it makes sense for you to just give a, a look at it. If you feel that this is right for you, uh, you can either buy it directly or you can obviously uh, write to us and know more about it. And this is for, as Piyush mentioned, this is for our students also. So for example, if you want to talk to us before, if you want to upgrade your package, those of you are students and want to uh, take advantage of this, then I would strongly recommend that you, that you do so. As I told you, these are, these are going to be much more structured than the sessions that we are conducting now. So if you're liking these sessions, then I'm, I can guarantee you that you're going to love these sessions that we are going to conduct. Okay, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. I'll uh, stop, sh share, I'll go back to my PPT very quickly, uh, okay. If you have any questions, anything at all, uh, please feel free to ask. I'm just sharing my number also here. Okay, when I, all the best for your exam is you, you have it on Wednesday, right? So all the best, let's hope you do well. And guys, I've shared the PDF also. So if you want to take the PDF, please do so. I've added a poll also. Uh, if you want to read the session, please do so. Any feedback at all, please feel free to uh, put it in the chat box. Uh, we are more than welcome. Uh, we are more than happy to work on any kind of feedback that you give us. And any questions regarding these crash course, please feel free to ask. I have about five minutes and I'm, I'm open to any questions. And you can ask general questions also, guys, if you have any GMAT related questions or anything as such. Uh, Ketan, uh, one, of, uh, one of the students is giving the exam on Wednesday, Ketan. So you just mentioned that he's taking it on Wednesday. You're welcome, Shah. You're welcome, Hemant. Glad you're liking these sessions. Any questions, guys? Okay, great. So I don't see any questions as such. Once again, feel free to write to us. I have the email ID is there. I have shared the calendar link also. I've shared the link of the course also. Okay. Oh, okay, Usman has a question. Can you can you send the questions on the support? Uh, Hemant, I've just shared the PDF. The questions are there on the PDF. Uh, we share the you, uh, the video link through email. Okay. Usman is saying, how would FX score? Yeah, Usman, you cannot miss any uh, miss any questions. By the way, uh, it's very important that you uh, mark all the questions. Come what may you have to do that. Okay. So you may have to work on your timing if you are falling short of time then uh, you really need to push yourself to make sure that you do all the questions well within limit. If by chance, if there are one or two questions which you feel that, hey, I'm just running out of time, I have 15 seconds, two questions there, mark something, don't leave it. If you leave it, you'll see a drop in your percentile. Okay, uh, so I can see Sanjeev, Jigesh, Saru, uh, Puja, you like this session, really, uh, thank you. Uh, it's great to hear that you're loving these sessions. Oh, Hemant is saying, no, I mean, if we have questions of our own, uh, uh, we clear doubt uh, of our students only on the forums, internal forums that we have, uh, but we do not support questions on email ID. So we have our own dedicated forums, okay? Internal forum for all our students. And there you can post any question that you want. Uh, any student can post any question that they want and we answer that within 24 to 48 hours. 
usually within 24 hours, but if it's a Saturday, Sunday, sometimes we end up answering it in 48 hours. But we don't provide mail support. I, I think the forum is much, much more better than email support. So I hope that answers your query, Hemant. Um, there we, yes, uh, the recording of the session will get uploaded on this YouTube channel. Uh, I've just shared it with you. I would say uh, subscribe to it. You'll get the notification once we upload it. We usually upload it on Monday by end of day or uh, worst case, sometimes we do it on Tuesday depending on um, the time that we have. Okay. So you can just subscribe to the YouTube link with David and uh, you will be get the, you'll get the notification. Okay, Hemant uh, has a question. Do you guys review profile? Yes, we do review profile, but we do it on case to case basis. Uh, we don't do it on a full time basis at this point of time because of the lack of time. But if uh, but uh, one or two cases, if you have, if you want us to review your profile, we'll definitely do it. That's not a problem. Okay, Usman has a question. What if we need to guess last two questions? Uh, Usman, guessing is better than uh, leaving it, is how I'll put it. Okay, so if you have to, if you're running out of time, guess because even if you get it wrong, that's still better than uh, leaving it unattempted. Okay, so Hemant, I hope that answers your query. Usman, I hope that answers your query also. Any other questions? You're welcome, David. Okay, I don't see any more questions. So, uh, so guys, I'm going to end the session now. Um, all the best once again. And if you want to work with us, uh, do feel free to get in touch with us. Okay, uh, have a good day, guys.